Good morning again. I'm Kemi De Silva Ibru. I am the founder of WARF, and we're here today with exciting thought leaders and leading advocates to discuss the very fundamental question of gender equality and women's rights. Are we there yet? Can we fundamentally say that women's rights equals human rights? I have with us today wonderful panelists that Adesua will be introducing shortly. But without wasting too much time, I'd like to welcome Mr. Lansana Wode, who is the Deputy Country Representative of the UN Women, to please start with a welcome address. Thank you very much, uh, Kemi. Excellent, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of WARI, the Women at Risk International Foundation and its partners, uh, including the United Nations system in Nigeria, I wish to warmly welcome you all to the event this morning. The event is the second Warriors Dialogue. The team women's rights are equal to human rights. This annual event aims to advance gender equality and the rights of women and girls by discussing and providing solutions to dealing with what I truly believe to be perhaps the most important barrier for achieving development in many parts of the world, including Nigeria. Gender equality, a concept that many believe that should be treated very importantly today, is a concept that everyone should be treated equally, regardless of whether they are men or women, boys and girls. And gender equality, is all, not only a human rights issue, but it is what many believe or recognize as smart economy. It's the surest way of building peace and is the surest way of building healthier economy across the world. Indeed, the sustainable development goals and other economic targets around the world are unachievable if half of the world population is hampered by restricted opportunity. And that is what uh, gender inequality stands for. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, for many years, far too many stakeholders, starting with uh, women's rights activists, women's movements and networks, many CSOs, and today many male allies, people in the academia, the private sector, international development partners, including the United Nations, et cetera, et cetera, have been working to advance gender equality. While there has been some progress, the pace and the achievement have remained painfully low. And so the question as to whether we are there yet, we have a pool of you that are panelists, that are experts in this area. You will be able to showcase where we are and whether we have gone anywhere further in this journey. From where I sit, I believe there is a long way to go. And where we are today is not where we are supposed to be. It's far from where we are supposed to be. And perhaps we are too far away from what should be the end of the journey. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in the 2021 World Economic Forum report, it was indicated that as a result of the global pandemic, the global gender parity decreased from 68% to 68.6% to 68%. And that was as a result of the impact of COVID, which further exacerbated the gap that existed. And based on the current progress, it's estimated that it will take 135.6 years to close the gender gap worldwide. And that depends on the dynamics that we will see going forward. The problem may even increase if we don't take appropriate steps. The largest current gap appears in the political empowerment category, uh, which widened by 2.4%. And this should concern Nigeria more than many, many, many countries in Africa. Nigeria today has less than 5% of women in leadership position in terms of people who are appointed um, in government roles, whether they are parliamentarians, et cetera, et cetera. 
The statistics is also further buttressed by the fact that in 81 countries around the world, again, Nigeria is part of this statistic, there has never been a female head of state. The second largest gap appears in economic participation and opportunity category. The proportion of women among skilled professionals have increased as a result of many efforts, and wage equality inched forward slightly. But positive developments, both are positive development. However, significant wage disparity persists, and the percentage of females in leadership roles remain imbalanced. Females also seem to have been more likely to lose jobs because of the pandemic and slower to regain those jobs once the pandemic relaxed and restrictions were lifted. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the ugliest part of gender inequality, as far as I know, is gender-based violence. And perhaps this is the best time to talk about gender inequality in an inclusive way beyond political participation, beyond economic participation, to talk about viol violence against women and girls, which hampers development at all levels and every corner of the world. We are in the period of a 16 days of activism. And let me start from the outset to thank all of you and congratulate all of us for the different efforts and endeavors that we are engaged in uh, to make sure that truly we continue to advocate for gender equality, or more especially to end violence against women and girls. Let me inspire you by saying that the 16 days of activism did not quickly, easily emanate from the United Nations. In other words, it's not a top-down thing. It was a bottom-down activity. Just to let you know that women have been struggling for too long a time to make sure that some of these um, imbalances, some of these inequalities, and more particularly gender-based violence, was eliminated in the world. It was um, in 1960 that some, some females actually tried to fight against um, a dictatorial government, and as a result of that, they were killed. Now, since that point, women continue to rally to fight any kind of violence against women and girls, and the momentum had continued to grow um, over the years. And that was precisely on November 25, 1960. Those sisters were in Dominican Republic, and they fought against the Recording in progress. They were very, they were very vocal for women's rights. And as a result, they were brutally murdered by city police and dumped down the king. In June 1990, the Center for Women's Global Leadership, along feminists who had attended the first Women's Global Institute on Women, Violence, and Human Rights, called for a global campaign of 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. With the growing global recognition of a need to end violence against women and girls, in December 20, 1993, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Girls through Resolution 48-104. This opened the door for collaboration in the fight against gender-based violence. And that is precisely what we are doing as starting since November 25. I believe and I recognize Wari as a major stakeholder in this fight. And part of what we are doing today is part of the fight to end gender inequality, but also specifically to end gender-based violence. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are here as panelists to explore the challenges, to see where we are globally, but more especially as Nigeria. I know that in Nigeria, many of the statistics around gender inequality are perhaps more pronounced, and Nigeria as a country has contributed significantly to some of these awkward statistics that we are talking about. I can only say that the event today and many of the events we are conducting uh, since the 25th of this month, went all the way to the Human Rights Day on the 10th of December, we contribute to changing what Nigeria is. We contribute to making sure that gender equality is advanced in Nigeria, and therefore that Nigeria truly takes is trend on the development trajectory and make this country a good country that it's supposed to be. Thank you very much. 
and I welcome you all to this event. Thank you very, very much, Lansana, for those encouraging words. And um, without wasting too much time, I would like to welcome the UN resident, humanitarian coordinator, Mr. Matthias Schmali, to please give us a keynote address. Thank you very much, uh, Kami. A very good morning to all of you. Um, Lansana is, in a way, a hard act to follow because he's already sort of delivered a keynote, <laughs> but I will try to make some additional uh, complimentary remarks. It's really uh, remarks. I, it's an honor to be given this opportunity to speak to you on this second annual uh, Women at Risk International Foundation Dialogue. We are, as Lansana already implied or indicated, a proud partner of WARIF in addressing gender-based violence with the support and through the EU UN Spotlight Initiative. Uh, the question that you have posed for all of us uh, this year, women's rights equal human rights, are we there yet, is an important one. Allow me to recall that as far back as 1995 at the UN Conference on Women in Beijing, women activists from across the globe delivered the famous rallying cry that women's rights are in fact human rights. At that conference, as we, I think, all know, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action was adopted. 189 countries, in fact, including Nigeria, pledged to achieve gender equality in practice and in law so that all women could fully enjoy their inalienable rights and freedoms on equal footing with men. So where are we 27 years later? Are we there yet? Sadly, the answer is no from our perspective in the UN. We are not there yet. Again, Lansana has spoken about this, although some progress has been made. But achieving gender equality and empowering women remains one of the, if not the great, unfinished business of our time. Now, allow me to underline that denying women and girls their basic rights is just fundamentally wrong, whatever other considerations we may have. It is fundamentally wrong from moral and all sorts of perspectives. And it also has serious social and economic consequences which hold everyone back. Economic development and the agreed 17 sustainable development goals that, again, the UN has agreed, including Nigeria, cannot be achieved by leaving half of the population behind. We have evidence from around the globe that the economic empowerment of women has a transformative effect and is a force multiplier for sustainable development. As I'm referring to economic empowerment, I remember talking a few weeks ago in Yola in Adamawa in a safe space provided by a Spotlight Initiative-backed NGO, talking with women and girls about what can be done to prevent violence against them. Several of them spoke about their economic empowerment being key, not least as it gives them some independence and lessens tensions at home, as several of them described. One of the many formidable women of this country the current Director General of the WTO, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala, once said that, quote, investing in women is smart economics, and investing in girls, catching them upstream, is even smarter economics, unquote. This is undoubtedly true. In Nigeria, as you all, and especially the women on the panel and who have tuned in, a, a robust women's movement, you are part of it, many of you, has built momentum across the nation, from the grassroots in communities to the upper reaches of government. Women's rights have advanced on many fronts, often due to the enormous efforts of this movement. Successes include that we have seen a slight decline of child marriage across the country. There are more data available on violence against women, in, that which are a basis for taking action, including legal action. An increased percentage of women are in paid jobs. 34 out of 36 states have passed the VAT Act. But or, despite these steps forward, gender-based violence, as Lansana already talked about, and discrimination continue to persist 
Nigeria remains a male-dominated society with several indicators pointing to the marginalized conditions of women and girls. And some examples, we all know them, women constitute less than 5% of elected members of the National Assembly. Despite what I said about child marriage, 43% of girls are married before the age of 18. 20% of women aged 15 to 49 have undergone female genital mutilation, and the list goes on. Now, behind these numbers are, of course, the many individual and real stories of women and girls being hindered in enjoying the same rights as men and boys. The Deputy British High Commissioner said in a discussion here in Abuja the other day that with one in three women experiencing violence, we all know someone who has been exposed to violation of some form or another. And there are, of course, the prominent and known cases. A few days ago, we all know that Labour Party woman leader Victoria Chintex was gunned down. It was a traumatic reminder that women are far from having the opportunities to play their rightful role in public life in Nigeria. We know from, as UN member states around the world that countries are better governed if there is gender equality in the political space. Again, we all know examples of women political leaders who've made more than significant contributions to advancing prosperity and peace in their respective country. Allow me to take off my UN neutrality hat and say that as a German, I am unsurprisingly thinking of Angela Merkel. Under the long period of her being the great orga at the top in Germany, where we have seen economic and political stability in the country. And under her courageous leadership, Germany became known around the world as a model country for opening its doors wide open for one million Syrian refugees. Again, I'm not so much making these comments as a German. I'm also German, but it is an example of what women, competent, excellent women leadership can lead to. Are we there yet in Nigeria? Again, no, sadly, we are not here in this country there yet, and many other countries, of course, for all the reasons I've already mentioned. In coming to a close, allow me to speak about several actions that we can continue to do to support the government and other stakeholders in order to make progress in achieving women's rights in Nigeria. Firstly, it's about laws, discriminatory laws, policies, practices that need to be eradicated. Legal and practical reforms must be upheld and must uphold the equal rights of women and girls within the family, within the workplace, within the public sphere. A good start would be the passage of the gender bills. You all know about them. I at time not say more about that here. So there is legal aspects of this that we need to continue working on. Secondly, from a UN perspective, we have a blueprint for achieving gender equality. It's called the 2030 Agenda. The UN's vision of development is one which leaves no one behind, and certainly not women and girls. It builds on the foundations of the Beijing Platform for Action I've already mentioned. As many of you might know, gender equality is the subject of SDG 5, but it is also embedded throughout the Development Agenda 2030 as a so-called cross-cutting issue. And in this or against this background, allow me to say that as a UN staffer, I'm pro proud to note that our Secretary General and our Deputy Secretary General, of course, another prominent woman leader that hails from your country, Mrs. Amina Mohammed, have achieved together, Antonio Guterres and her, have achieved in their five years of leadership across the UN, gender parity in the most senior leadership positions across the UN system. Lower down in the ranks, we have some way to go, but it is a significant milestone. How have they done it? One important, if not the key element, has been prioritizing the appointment of women in all cases where there are candidates of equal qualification and experience. And recruitment processes across the UN in many parts of the UN cannot proceed if there is not evidence of a minimum percentage of women candidates being qualified and in the mix. 
Since arriving a year ago in Nigeria, I've been intrigued by observing that women are much more prominently represented in leadership positions in the private sector as opposed to the public sector. Now, several captains of industry, including notably men who I asked how they did it, said that setting deliberate targets and quotas was undoubtedly a major element. So affirmative action has to be a part of the future. Thirdly, uh, Lanzana has already widely spoken about the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. So let me just say that what we need to do here is to follow up on the VAP acts to get the remaining two states to sign them and then to get all 36 of them to have costed model action plans for the implementation. Only if laws are put into practice can women and girls be truly protected by these laws. So in closing, the answer to today's question, as I've said several times from the UN's perspective, is sadly no. We are not there yet, but we are moving in the right direction. As our Deputy Secretary General says, the glass is some full, not half full, but some full. And while it is at times hard to stay positive and not become cynical or bitter in view of the countless stories of discrimination and marginalization of women and girls, we must keep a positive mindset and continue to work together to strive for the rights of Nigerian women and girls until we get to the answer being yes. I salute the incredibly impressive and impactful work of WARIF and a number of women-led organizations I've been privileged to visit and see in action over these past few months. Thank you very much, and I wish us all a fruitful continuation of this event. Yes, we've listened to thank you for staying by and thank you for being there. Thank you, Dr. Kemi, for running the show up until now. Thank you to our panelists who have been patient and those who are listening. Having listened to our two speakers, clearly the choice for Warif that says women's rights, human rights, are we there yet, is a good one. But listening to them, Lantana says there is a long way to go. And Matthias says we are not there yet. So the questions that will be our panelists will be dealing with is finding what's keeping us back. Why aren't we there? How can we shorten the distance to that place? I'd like to start with Ula. Why am I starting with Ula? Because Ula is a lifelong advocate of women's, of human rights, and she's worked in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a little video that describes who she is before we take her point. Again, I say thank you to all my panelists, especially Katie, Dr. Awushika, who have been patiently waiting. So let's hear who Ula is before we engage her in conversation. Ms. Mola is a lifelong advocate for human rights, in particular the rights of women and girls. She has worked and lived more than 25 years in Sub-Saharan Africa and can see the progress that is being made. She believes that access to sexual and reproductive health services, including access to family planning, is central to women's empowerment and to reaching the SDGs. Ms. Mola holds an MSc in Economics and Business Administration and a Master's in Human Rights and Democracy. Your, your statistics, your credentials are interesting, especially because of your experience in the economic sector. I would like you to answer one simple question. In your opinion, people have said the COVID pandemic released a hydra-headed problem that made us realize that women hadn't really moved anywhere because of the increase in domestic violence. You say that if women have more rights to make at least decisions on their own, they won't be in that position. So I'd like you to speak to that very quickly and give us a perspective of how women making their decisions can help shorten the distance to making women's rights human rights. Eula, the floor is yours. Hmm. So, well, as a feminist, I'm coming to this from angle from two points, both as the head of the United Nations Sexual and Productive Health Agency here in Nigeria, but also really as a lifelong feminist. Um, you know, if I had the clear answer to that, we would be in a different place in the world today because then we would have created this movement to make substantial changes. I think what we what we what we have to look at is how 
bodily autonomy and bodily integrity relates to a woman's ability to make her own decisions. Because if you are continuously exposed to violence, if you are continuously pregnant, if you are deprived your own right to make the choices about your own body, then what happens is that you are busy surviving and in all of your economic active years, if you have a child every year, you're actually home in all your economic active years and not contributing to the economy. You will say that, and I think there is a, a point to that, that you are contributing when you are at home. That is very, very true, but it's not a recognized contribution to the economy in any country. It is also important for us to be aware that when a woman decides when she wants to have children, when a woman decides how many children she wants and when she wants them, she makes different decisions than men do in the home. And when women are empowered to make those decisions, what we know happens is that the children are more likely to be better educated. And we know that education is fundamental for economic growth and for social growth. And there has been a very strong focus over the years on only looking at economic growth. And the thing is that there's no evidence to the table that really sustains that economic growth automatically leads to social growth. And in the way that we measure economic growth, there's also an inbuilt inequality in that. Because it's like with everything else, it's spent on averages, and then you have some very rich people, and even though we measure a Gini effect, which is, by the way, that coefficient is very high here in Nigeria, that doesn't take into consideration the gender inequality of those numbers. So you can have a very wealthy segment of society and your GDP looks good. Nigeria is an example of that. And then you still have a hundred, more than 100 million people living in extreme poverty. The vast majority of them are women. And these are women who are not empowered to make their own choices about their health. And if you're not healthy, you're going to struggle to be assertive and get your way into the decision-making table. So I pulled a few numbers prior to this. And, and if we look at what we know around a woman's health here in Nigeria, and now I do have to look at my notes just to make sure that I don't say something that is wrong, it is that only 11% of Nigerian women feel that they are empowered to make any decisions about their own health. That means that 89% of Nigerian women are not empowered to make all of their own decisions about whether to go to a doctor. Now I'm not even talking about rights and choices around reproduction. And if you're not able to do that, and if you do not really control your bodily autonomy, then that impacts on your ability to claim your space and claim your rights in all areas. And that is why we approach equality in UNFPA not only from SGD5, but actually as SGD5, in particular target 5-6, to being key to unlocking the potential that lies in all the other 17 SDGs. Because if we don't see it that way, we will never be able to get to that level of equality. I want to just also add, and I think we very often forget that, is that we have a lot of big conventions we talk about, and, and I'm one of them, but the Human Rights Framework, back in 1993 in Vienna, it was actually recognized that all human rights are indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated. And that means you cannot drop one. And I sometimes wonder if this movement that we are, are building, are we good enough to hold duty bearers accountable for where they have signed up to under the human rights conventions. The year after in Cairo, which was the RC also mentioned, it, the world agreed that rights and choices and reproductive rights and choices were universal and they were indeed part of the human rights framework. Fast forward 25 years later in Nairobi, Thousand, almost 10,000 people marched to Nairobi to reaffirm the Cairo agenda and the ICPD. 
And it's, I think it's mind boggling that whether we talk Beijing or Cairo, that we still struggle to have real progress. And I think part of that is that we really haven't come to a point where women own her own body and her own decisions. If decisions are made for you, how are you then empowered to claim your human rights? And how are you then in a position where your full potential can be realized? And it's interesting that we, the world have affirmed over and over again UNFPA's free transformative goals, which is ending preventable maternal deaths. And may I add to that, that that is one of the highest in the world is here in Nigeria, both the average number of 514, but also Northwest and Northeast, which is 1,932 and 1,549 respectively. This is a lot of potential lost for a country. So I think it all comes with your ability to make your own choices about how you want to contribute and the life you want to live. Because that's when you contribute to society, to economic development and social development. And I agree with your other speakers. I don't want to repeat everything they've said, but really we are not there yet. And unfortunately, the progress we thought we had really showed not to be sustained during COVID because the world regressed and we added 20 years. So we are now, I think at 132 years or something before we have equality. We do not have that time in a world of 8 billion people. 8 billion is infinite possibilities if we get it right. But if we do not get it right, it's also infinite deprivation of human rights. And we all know who bears the brunt it's always women and girls. And if we want to continue to be successful with 8 billion people, we have to invest in them. Because otherwise, the children will not be adequately educated. There will be more people living in poverty. And it will destabilize the world. We are already pretty unstable. And when we focus on peace, we cannot neglect what we know, what evidence does show us. Women play a critical role because we think differently. So we bring different things to the table. So peace that is negotiated with women around the table is more sustainable and is more lasting. And all of that contributes to economic development. So when we talk about leaving no one behind, we need to get it right because otherwise we will yet again fail our promise to women and girls. And that means we will leave them behind and we cannot let that happen. We have to deliver the 2030 agenda and make sure that no one is left behind. Time, I appreciate your, your perspective. I think at this point in time, I would like to listen to Dr. Wushika, the Nigerian in the house. Ms. Mueller has said, we have gone a distance, but we are held back by the fact that women don't make decisions about their bodies, that economics, uh, then the economics, okay, I think we should take uh, Dr. Ushika's biography before we get to hear her. But just as she's getting ready, you're going to be speaking from the Nigerian perspective. Economics is not enough. Having control over your body is what Ms. Mueller said. So let's go. Mrs. Ibukwolua Awoshika is the founder and CEO of the Chair Center Group a diversified group covering manufacturing, retail, and banking security systems. She is an African entrepreneur, author, global culture shaper, and motivational speaker. She was the first female chairperson at First Bank of Nigeria Limited. It becomes interest in social issues, especially on challenges confronting women, spurred her to co-found the Women in Business, Management, and Public Service, WIMBIS, where she also served as the chairperson. Thank you. Welcome back to the studios. Dr. Awoshika is definitely a Nigerian, and she's been in Nigeria for more than oh, maybe almost 60 years anyway. So you know, and you have championed the founding of a, an organization that seeks to give women empowerment. Now, since WIMBIS has been created, more than eight women have become MDs of banks in Nigeria. You were the first female chair 
or First Bank in Nigeria. And yet, we have these numbers that say, whether we have money or not, if we do not have control over our bodies, then we can move far. What are your thoughts on women moving far, regardless of all that's happening to us? Dr. Awoshika, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adesu, and a big thank you to the Warish team. And uh, hello to my colleagues from around the world. Thank you for speaking concerning our country. Well, the way I see it is, if a woman doesn't have economic power, she also doesn't have a voice. So ensuring that she has economic power, understands how to build personal wealth, and has a sense of ownership of her own wealth in a way that <clears throat> she then has the power of choice would be key. And so there's knowledge, there's power, and there's understanding. And the choices that she then makes will determine if she has power over her body or not. You know, it's about if you have the money and the independence, you're not compelled to marry a guy that is really not the right man for where you want to go, for what you want out of your life, and, and all of those uh, options. If you have uh, knowledge and you have economic independence in some way, then you wouldn't uh, get into situations or scenarios uh, because you think you do not have a choice. So it's important to educate uh, women. It's also important to empower them. Those two things, knowledge and economic independence allows the power to choose. And then the education allows them to know what is the right kind of choices to make in order to uh, be able to have uh, the kind of life that um, they want for themselves as an individual. In terms of human rights, it is your right to choose what you want. It's your right to choose what you consider to be right for you in the context of your own vision and personal ambition for your life. And having that independence also allows you as a woman to have the capacity to support other women and to help break the cultural and the traditional mindset that seems to tell a woman she doesn't have certain choices. And it runs from the value chain of being a girl, you know, to thinking that uh, you have limited options in terms of your career choices, or you have limited uh, options to say, I want to marry or I don't want to. And if I want to, who do I want to marry? You know, and not marry just for convenience, not marry just for money, not just marry for economic provision and all of that, as many women also tend to do. And even when you do make the choice to marry, if it whilst in it, you find that uh, it's an abusive marriage in whatever form that then threatens your independence and your person, you must have the power. A lot of women are locked up in those situations because they think of their limited ability to make a choice. Oh, I can't afford to keep my children and therefore I will stay. I cannot afford to take care of myself, therefore I will stay. I do not have the ability to provide accommodation for myself, therefore uh, I, I will stay. You know, so many times that when you listen to women, you just ask yourself, this cannot be how to live. So for me, even in our traditional context and cultural context, which tends to uh, position the woman as having limited choice, you know, education, and economic empowerment are tools that frees her to have the ability to do things. The other critical component is the support system, where the women in the community realize that they need one another. And in needing one another, they can build a tribe of support. When you build a tribe of support that gives you the courage and the strength to move on or to make choices, even when you're emotionally weak, to make the right choice. That strengthens your hand and helps you uh, in many ways to be able to make the kind of choices that empowers you to independently be who you want to be and to do the things uh, that you want to do, as opposed to uh, the traditional context of being locked into for life, no matter 
what is in what situation you find yourself in uh, as a woman. You have told us clearly that the cultural context seems to limit the woman's choices. And education breaks that. Education makes it possible for you to earn and be more independent and make choices. However, what we do know that is happening is that with the result of such things, violence against women seems to have increased, especially during the COVID pandemic. So I'd like to, at this point in time, bring somebody who is an activist in this area. Let's get to meet her first. Katie was one of the first to sign in today, even though she's six hours behind. So let's meet Katie first, you know, before we get her to respond to this question. So very quickly, let me run something. Katie Kostner is an internationally recognized author, activist, and educator. She has lectured at over 5,000 colleges and high schools in North America. As the first woman in history to speak out nationally as the victim of acquaintance rape, she appeared on the cover of Time magazine at age 18. She has also appeared on Oprah, CNN, and Good Morning America, as well as dozens of other international news programs. The U.S. Ambassador to India has invited Ms. Kostner to lecture for 19 days in India, and the U.S. Department of Defense has had her train their top 200 officers. Yes, Katie, thank you yet again for signing in early. And it's very interesting to have you here because people can find you and listen to your podcast. In fact, some people describe you as crazy. You know, you're one woman with very strong views. When you believe in it, you run it. Acquaintance rape is date rape, isn't it? Talk to us about that. Talk to us about violence against women. Talk to us, talk to us about how that can color whatever progress we make in our country, for example, as we move forward. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you for inviting me to join this conversation. It's critical work that everyone is doing on this meeting. Um, I have been at this work since I was 18, uh, trying to raise awareness around violence against women. I am the executive director for the Take Back the Night Foundation, and we have over a thousand events globally. Um, and our events are designed to empower and bring together those who've been affected by sexual violence. And as I was listening to all, all of our conversations and thinking about violence against women, one thing that I don't know if you know, this is the place to bring it up, but in the United States, when I was raped at age 18 by another student at my college, there was no such thing as date or acquaintance rape. It was rape by a stranger. A woman was grabbed off the street um, and, and brutally assaulted by someone she'd never met. And that was the concept 30 years ago, 32 years ago here in the United States. And really, truly, that was the concept of, of sexual violence around the world. And rape was an act of force. It wasn't even thought of as an act without consent. And in the United States, like in Nigeria, sexual violence could only be perpetrated by a man against a woman. And what we have done in the United States and many other places where we've raised awareness and tried to change the rights of women, ironically, when you change the rights of men, to also say, I can be raped, they start to have a different mindset about women's rights too. <laughs> so when we made all the laws in the United States gender neutral and redefined what sexual violence was and created a whole awareness campaign over the last many decades, it actually improved <laughs> the overall understanding and feeling that we have that bodily autonomy uh, to feel safe and secure. Uh, the other thing that I, I might ask everyone to consider is if we bring men as potentially victims into the conversation, might they change their motivation or perspective on women's rights if they start to think about that they too could potentially um, be considered, you know, entitled to their own bodily rights. So I just 
I was just thinking about, you know, all the complexities of what I, I just said, because it's turning our idea of how do we, how do we achieve this change and what I'm, and too, like Ula, a feminist, of course, fierce and feisty, but allyship and building bridges is critical in terms of getting to where we want to go. And it, all the work I've done, you have to find those who already have power, men who already have power and control. Oftentimes I found the ones who are most interested in finally changing their attitudes are older men with granddaughters. And, you know, when life looks short at this end, all of a sudden the motivation for how do we rethink power and control and it might be protectionistic for some, but you you change their attitude and you change the way they think about sharing power with women. And I hate to say sharing power with women, but we have to start somewhere. And the only other thought I, I wanted to add is the education theme that we've been also discussing is critical. When we have clarity as individuals about how we define a term, and how we can apply it to our own bodies and minds, the, the definition itself becomes a, a form of an empowerment. So to me, having that clarity through consistent, clear messaging and education um, around all of the issues you've discussed, including sexual violence, to me is important. Defining what bodily autonomy means, defining what the resources are, and making sure that um, you know, as many people feel they can access them and understand how, you know, even, even accessing justice is one of the things that we try to do through Take Back the Night and ask, a asking those who have the power to enforce the laws is often part of the problem. So those are, you know, some of my thoughts around, you know, where we might go, especially in Nigeria, since the laws are still that only men can rape women. And the other one I think is true there, although forgive me, I'm, I'm not Nigerian, is that marital rape is still not recognized under the law either. And this concept that women are property um, has to go. <laughs> women can't be the property of any man. There should be no right to any, you know, any woman's body, no matter you know, how much money you have and, and that equality of um, treatment has to be not bound by marriage, you know, uh, bound up by marriage, <laughs> Imp impeded. Thank you. And the perspective that you have um, shared with us from the area of, I mean, your work, which is Take Back the Night, is a good one. And I think, I'm just wondering if Mueller is in the house, because... As I expect everybody to respond just one more time to one question, everybody give their perspective to what the next five years should look like for Nigeria. I would like to ask that people who are listening, who have called in, kindly put your questions in the tab, in the chat box, in the Q&A tab, so that we can have our panelists address those questions. So uh, at this point in time, I would like to bring in Mr. Laurent, our, our fourth speaker, our fourth panelist, who's actually representing... Uh, is Ugo Daniels. Daniels, yes, and I'd like to introduce him, and clearly what, um, okay, Mr. Mr. Ugo is ready, but I just wanted to round up, basically what, um, what um, Katie is telling us is that we need to look at our laws, we need to take the theme of the United Nations this year, for example, which is Unite Against Violence, we need to begin to pull men and women together to do this, let men realize it's also their problem, and um, Others, I would like Mr. Laurent to speak from the perspective of how do we unite to address this problem so we can move faster. But first, let's get to meet him. Laurent M.J. De Beck was assigned Chief of Mission of IOM to the Federal Republic of Nigeria on the 1st of November, 2022. He joined IOM in 1996, where he occupied several positions in Belgium, Burundi, Côte d'Ivoire, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Haiti, and Rwanda. He obtained a degree in Public and International Affairs, Diplomacy, and International Economy 
as well as a degree in social and economic sciences from the University of Louvain La Nouve in the Kingdom of Belgium and the University of Tilburg in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So thank you very much. Um, so I have the honor to, to be with you today um, in this dialogue representing um, our Deputy Director General Ugoshi Daniels, who was unfortunately unable to come. Uh, so it's my pleasure to represent her and, and present the uh, International Organization for Migration views on this important subject. Um, I think there's been recognized by, by speakers before me um, the importance uh, to recognize that there were some steps undertaken and done, uh, showing some progress. But at the same time, the amplitude of the, of the problem remains huge. And if they, we can witness some progress, we still have a lot of work ahead. Let me focus on two uh, specific approach, which uh, are extremely important for the organization. And I would like to give the examples of Nigeria. The first one is the humanitarian context. We have, we have a database of people displaced in the country in the north, uh, central, west, and, and east, and 1.9 million are women and girls. And they are the ones the most suffering of accessing to basic services, to protection uh, in a crisis, set, crisis setup. Um, so they are... At the same time, the needs of them are increasing, but the humanitarian capacity is decreasing, facing this amplitude. Um, we, we are working with uh, root-based uh, organization, community-based organizations, and we, we have noticed, and that's similarly to the 44 countries of crisis where IOM is involved, that we can only improve the situation for women and girls if we worked with them, empowering them to carry out their own activities. At the same time, there is, if we have the capacity to give them uh, the power to, to speak, the power to take actions and decisions regarding their own safety, um, we still have a lot to do in empowering them for changing the social norms. Uh, we have to ensure that they discuss with the, the right people for making those changes sustainable. And this is the, where the issue may remain, the, the discussions of changes with traditional leaders, with religious leaders, uh, with authorities remain an, an issue and, and difficult. So that, what, that's one aspect of providing and supporting women and girls in life-saving support. Is, remains a key issue, but then to us, one of the unique solutions is involving them in making their own changes. The second setup, in which relates to IOM and, and migration, and more specifically, mobility. The organization is supporting uh, Nigerians who are returning back to Nigeria. In the last five years, we have supported more than 15,000 women coming back to Nigeria after a difficult journey. Most of them, if not the majority, have left as uh, household uh, ads facing issues in integrating economically the country. As you may know, the, 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 the unemployment rate of, among women is extremely, remains extremely high, the highest in the country, uh, underemployment similarly. So they, they the only possibility for them as, as wife, mother, or household head is to migrate. So it's their choice indeed, but it's a forced choice. And unfortunately, they are easily victims of uh, organized crime institutions and such, such as traffickers and smugglers. So they may be facilitated access to other country, but during the journey, they are easily victims of sexual assaults, violation of their basic rights. And they, in the countries where they go, they face important issues of integration um, and often are obliged to take what we call dirty jobs, which is not dignifying their situation at all. So in the return process, we accompany them to reintegrate. But we realize that a very basic right is the right to education, 
the right to vocational training and, and empowering them for improving their skills to facilitate their integration on the labor market. We have, I, we have mentioned that indeed the economy is not um, uh, the panacea and, and the only solution, but it may contribute for them to actually also progress socially. In, and in their own. So a basic right which is not attained yet is this right of education, right of employment, and right to choose. In this regard, we, 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 the, the conclusion from our organization is that the listening is not enough. We have to create a change, and the change will not be feasible if we don't empower the, the women and girls in taking faith in their own choice for changing their own situation capable to talk to the right persons and changing in this regard of social norms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Loro. You did raise one issue that some of us haven't thought about, the fact that unemployment actually fuels migration, especially for women. If unemployment is high in any country, women are the ones that suffer the most. And um, <clears throat> the sad thing is when they're running away, they get raped and they also experience terrible circumstances. So um, Dr. Kemi has been sitting down here quietly and we've agreed that we're going to keep the conversation going. Hi, Katie. Um, thank you so much for being so patient with us, Katie. I know that you've been up for hours and we really appreciate the input that you've brought to this conversation. Worth mentioning when you said um, in your discussions about changing the narrative by including men. I mean, this is something that I find happening now in Nigeria. Um, there is a particular act called the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. And this is an act that we've been pushing on a policy level to be domesticated across all our states in the country. And it's the first time that the rape laws were amended mm -hmm. to include men. So I find it interesting that when you say to us that when you look at your history through the lens of progress, you can note that point in time when the laws changed and men were then included in the conversation and how that started to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. So we're hopeful. And then that's very positive for me, mm -hmm. listening in. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final words? Because I know that you're rushing off. And as I said, we're very grateful well, for you to be here. You no, know, no, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm definitely different from everyone else on the call. And I, I think the power that I have seen in grassroots activism and truly, you know, Take Back the Night, for example, is just an unwieldy upstart. <laughs> you know, we were, we were marching and banging on pots and pans and making a ruckus any way we could. The power of music and song, um, dance, um, poetry, uh, spoken word, that's the narrative that inspires change. And when you can empower people through experiential um, events, they, they, it's tangible. It feels, you know, you need the brain and you need the heart to affect change in the world. And to me, I think you, you know, my suggestion, my hope is that by having events and, and getting people out of doors and, and, you know, from COVID, get people back out, get them interacting, get when, 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 when we don't feel alone, we are empowered. When we know that we are not the only going through something, we want to, we feel encouragement to speak out and do more. And the fear factor dissipates because then we know we can do it because someone else is doing it. My own story, thousands of people come up and say, I thought, thank goodness for you. I couldn't even understand what happened to me until I heard your story. So I think that's the thing I hope I can inspire all of you to do is continue the work you're doing and just think, how can I do it in a, a, a very um grassroots way too to make it as accessible as possible you know in india we're doing some work in india around sexual violence and they just started having take back the night events um through our work 
And one of the things they're doing is we, we do these clothesline projects, meaning people draw on shirts and each shirt re represents a different color and they put their stories and then hang them in public. Um, so, you know, th there are lots and lots of ways to affect change, um, but empowerment and feeling confident is the start of everything. So that's, that's, Thank you for having me, Thank though. Thank you so much, Katie. Much we appreciate coming. your time and great suggestions because, by the way, Warif is already working in that direction. In a couple of days, the fourth walk is going to happen. People are going to walk against rape and violence Amazing. against women and boys, I will find out now. So in three days, in two days. On Saturday. On Saturday, Saturday the yes. Third. yes. So it's an opportunity to invite, I mean, you can watch online if you wanted to. And invite people to And come invite out people to, to come out to walk. So, but the idea of, you know, making this entertaining is interesting. Okay, Dr. Awoshika, what are your thoughts after, this, after listening to uh, what Mueller has said, I mean, no, sorry, what Katie has said, and then what Laurent has said about the fact that economic reasons make women migrate. And um, Katie's suggestion now about making the, the work more grassroots oriented. How do you think Nigeria should move going forward in the next five years to shorten that gap where women's rights become human rights? What have we done wrong that we can change? Well, I think when we talk about economic uh, reasons for migration, that would be when you are disadvantaged economically. So if, um, if we can find a way to create an even playing ground for women to compete and uh, also have the ability to be empowered economically, I don't think that uh, people will move if they have no need, no need to. As for tying that then up with uh, uh, sexual uh, violent challenges as it affects women, it's, it, the thing is, half the time we're having this conversation at one stage that is far from the root. We can deal with some of the issues um, that are current for women who are already at a certain stage of life. But our biggest strategy would be to go to the beginning of the pipeline. It would involve, you know, trying to re-educate our women in terms of who they are, their mindset about their, their self-perception of themselves and their ability to uh, have respect even for themselves as a human, because we're fighting two battles. You're, find, you're fighting the battles of the mindset of the woman in terms of how she sees herself. You're also fighting the battle of the rest of society and the men in how they see the women and what they think that she deserves. So we need to deal with the issue of the women, re-educate, reset, change the mindset of women to self-appreciate, to have a sense of self-worth and to feel an entitlement and a right to be who they want to be. And in giving them the right to do that, to support them by creating an enabling environment, which is provided by education and by economic uh, opportunities, which then gives them power, like I said earlier, to make uh, the right kind of choices. And it also comes uh, uh, involves how we raise girls. How do we raise girls to feel disadvantage to their male peers or to their brothers. You know, how, how do we raise girls to feel that they're, they are lesser than their brothers, in a sense? How do we structure uh, family assets and positioning to make a younger male member of the family feel that he has right and power over the female member of the family, even if she's older. So there's structural issues that we need to deal with because we then carry that societal structural issues into, we carry it into marriages, we carry it, carry it into workplaces. It affects the perception, which is why boys and girls are, I mean, girls compete effectively academically at school, are able to compete for their first jobs with the boys, but get into the workplace and somewhere along the line by middle management, they start disappearing. Why? Because they start getting married, start having children, and then they get the feeling that their husbands can tell them, leave your job and just sit at home, or any of those kind of situations that, that can show up and come up and how families react and respond to that. A girl is being beaten by a husband and her aunties and mothers are telling 
how that uh, every woman learns how to survive these things, you know, survive your marriage, work it out and all of that. Until one day, you suddenly you realize you've been killed by the same husband you were compelling her to stay with so that she doesn't have a voice to, and she doesn't live with a stigmatization that something is wrong with the fact that when her life is put at risk by her marriage, that she has the choice to walk out if she needs to, to protect herself and ask for help. So there, there, there are things we can do for those who are already at a certain state and in those situations, but there's a lot more we can do in terms of our laws, in terms of the structure of our family, raising their girls, in terms of how we um, make women feel in the workplace, how we make women feel in the society, the total reaction and perception of issues. Every time one more girl is killed, everybody's like, oh, wow. But everybody knew the girl was being beaten. Everybody knew the guy was violent. And nobody thought, you know, that she had the first right to protect and fight for her life by leaving that marriage without being judged by the society and, and all of those things. And like I said earlier, economic empowerment gives women choices. It makes you able to work out if you need to. It makes you able to make decisions that are yours because you have, uh, you're in a position to, and, and, and all of those things. We have a long way to go. We have the laws to make. We're better from where we are, but we're actually in a more critical period. Because right now, our biggest challenge is we're at a place of conflict. Yeah. between more educated women yeah. or more, yeah. let's say more enlightened women mm -hmm. who want more out of their lives. Mm -hmm. And there's a conflict between what they want and the cultural environment that they still right. live in. Yeah. So we're raising these girls that we're educating, but we're not changing the cultural concept under which they live. Mm -hmm. And we expect them to find how to survive in it by themselves. Fantastic. Well, Ms. Ula had Final said words. earlier on mm -hmm. about 89% of us not being empowered. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to just have few words, final words before you leave, because as Dr. Awashika rightly highlighted, a major component in our challenge in this part of the world is the cultural bias, the social cultural norms that are being practiced across communities, and women ostracized in homes silently being abused because of these cultural biases. Perhaps you have a few words to share before you leave us this afternoon. Thank you, I will, and, um, and I'm sorry that we are all in such a hurry to leave because this is really an important conversation, I think. I want to, you know, also just share a little bit of reflection on, on whatever has come on um, uh, on this conversation. But starting with this issue about bodily autonomy, I think where, you know, to a large extent, I would say that I, I do agree with... Um, with, uh, with, with Dr. Avosika, because it is about economic empowerment. But I think where we get it wrong is that we assume women have access to economic means. If you are married off when you are 13 and locked in a home and not allowed to leave, you do not have any access to economic means to make your own decisions. And that's why I keep saying it's, I mean, child marriage for us is also a harmful practice. It's also part of gender-based violence because it deprives you of that basic right to go out and make your own decisions. So you cannot, it's, it's a chicken and an egg situation, but if you're not at the privilege where you can leave your house freely, how do you then become an economic active person? I think that is something we really need to think about. And also remember, violence have many forms. So one thing is, I mean, and again, if 89% cannot even leave the house to go and see a doctor or don't feel the empowered to do that, if you cannot leave the house without the company of a male member of the household, how do you do that? If you're kicked out of school, and we also make that assumption, it was said, we educate our girls, well, we don't educate enough in Nigeria. That's another challenge. Girls are simply not finalizing school. There might be high enrollment, but completion rates are bad. And more than 50% of Nigerian girls and women do not complete their education and, and are not able to read and write to a level that we would expect children to do. So I think, and then violence also in, in places like Lagos, where young women have access to digital media, digital violence and photos shared is also violence. There's so many shapes of, of gender-based violence. And I deliberately say gender because we also know that 
violence against men and boys underreported in Nigeria. We, we have to really think this through and think about what does it mean? And I think the accountability frameworks are important. Katie, who's unfortunately left us also, flagged the importance of having access to justice. This is one of the major priorities for UNFPA, also as the AOR for gender-based violence. AOR is our area of responsibility to end gender-based violence, in particular in emergencies. So having that, ending the impunity is so important. And when we talk about cultural biases, we can do, we do a lot of behavior change communication. We all do that. We advocate with religious leaders, with political leaders, but ultimately it's about power. And who gives away power voluntary? This is for me the scariest question because if we cannot get to a point where power is voluntarily shared, how do we then get to equality? I am yet to see global leaders anywhere in the world to voluntarily give away power. And that I think is the biggest challenge ahead of us. In Nigeria during COVID, we think that violence increased from one in three to one in two. Think about what that means. That means every time you talk to two women, one of them is likely to have survived some form of gender-based violence. That is bad. And I'm sorry, I like to call a spade a spade. So I'm using maybe not sort of the politically correct words, but we need to talk about it. Yeah, because we have a question before you run off. We have a question that you might be able to contribute to. And of course, I'm sure Dr. Kemi can also contribute to that question. We want to talk about the impact of climate change on domestic violence, and what solutions would you advocate before you tell us bye-bye? So you know what? I think climate change is very, very real. But I don't think it drives the domestic violence piece. I think climate change is more a driver of instability and poverty. And maybe the poverty is the driver of domestic violence. But we also know that if women make choices, they make better choices. So women have a direct impact on how we mitigate climate change. For instance, how do you cook? If you don't have to go out and, and make charcoal, then you don't deforest the country. Then you can make other choices. So I do think we need to be, be smart about this. But can I just say, I read the questions in the chat. I have two things I want to flag before I sign off. Okay. Be careful in Nigeria not to say everything is bad in the North and everything is bad in the South because it's not true. Gender-based violence is quite equally distributed between all six geopolitical zones. Mm -hmm. Child marriage is very high, and that's a harmful practice and considered violence. It's very high in the North, that is correct. But female genital mutilation, cutting, is in the South. That's where we have the problems. So be careful that we do not end up in this dichotomy of, of being... Muslims against Christians and Northerners against Southerners, because it does not reflect Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. One size does not fit all in this country. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's also a call on everyone here to really read the statistics and understand them. Mm -hmm. Because cultural beliefs do play in, but FTM, as I said, is in the South, marriage, child marriage is in the North. So let me end by maybe quoting Nelson Mandela and talk about cultural biases. Culture comprise traditions. Traditions are man-made, and therefore man can change them. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a I good way. Yeah, yeah, better. yeah. Thank you, you know. so much, Ms. Well, for that. I'm we are dynamic. Culture is dynamic. Absolutely. And we change with time. And Lansana, I, I appreciate all the panelists, but Lansana is still in the house. I believe we can put the last question to him so that we can get his perspective. So if the... If technical, okay, that's the question, and I think Lantana should do that. What actions can be taken to change the mindset of cultures and traditions in Nigeria where things like child marriage and female genital mutilation still exist? Well, Lantana, I, I hope you'll be able to put on your, your, your camera and respond to that, but I believe it's also something that, that's right. Yes, cultural practices like child marriage and female genital mutilations, what actions do you think we can take 
to mitigate that. that narrative. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Uh, when I came to Nigeria, one of the first things that I was involved in was really to bring together uh, traditional leaders, not only from Nigeria, but across Africa, uh, precisely to talk about their role on ending uh, harmful traditional practices, such as child marriage, female genital mutilation, and all the rest of things. Um, and that has evolved over time. Uh, it was a difficult battle at the starting point. Uh, but having these uh, traditional religious leaders to understand uh, the impact of these practices under their work, uh, many of them, first and foremost, they are able to uh, organize themselves, they put out comic space, and then they have, have a group called COTLA, uh, Council of mm -hmm. Traditional Leaders in Africa, mm -hmm. that are working with GNO men and other mm -hmm. agencies to uh, promote mm -hmm. cultural change. I think that is, that is a starting point. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, mm -hmm. I mean, young people are also very critical mm -hmm. to this fight, uh, the way they socialize, uh, young men, young women, but also boys and schools. Mm -hmm. So institutions that deal with young people mm -hmm. uh, are also important mm -hmm. in the fight. Uh, Warif has been involved with the uh, university in the mm -hmm. fight against gender-based violence. I think these are all stakeholders that we can engage. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, cultural change does not uh, rest with any one person. So it's about bringing everybody on board in the society, uh, in grassroots communities, um, at the level of government, at the level of private sector. So we all work towards it. Uh, so the biggest stakeholders here are those who are responsible for traditions and cultures, traditional leaders, but also younger people who can also socialize in a different way. And those are the things that we are working on as here in Omen, and I believe by other institutions also. Thank you. We kept him for a bit, but what are your thoughts on that, though, about I mitigating, I mean, culture and, and tradition? I think fundamentally that is our very root cause mm -hmm. when it comes to gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. We always focus on the patriarchy because we're a low middle income country. That's right. And that is something that we cannot move away from. Mm -hmm. But we must always remember that if we continue, however, to have social and cultural practices that subjugate women, and encourage the violence against mm -hmm. girls and women. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Awashika said, that is the very beginning, and that is where we have to start to change that narrative. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited about the conversation that That's we've right. had. Yes. I'm sure you are too. Yes, I am. And yes, we've I had am. exciting mm -hmm. insight from all the different panelists, and we're very grateful for everyone that stayed in and um, listened to the conversation right through to the end. Yeah, but most critical, just listen. Don't listen and walk away. Listen and do something. And one exactly. of the things you could do is, at least if you're in Lagos area, go for the walk. Absolutely. What are the details of the walk? We so now the up. walk is on Saturday. Mm -hmm. This is December the 3rd. We actually are um, an organization that is looking at the issue through a global lens. Mm -hmm. So we're marching across many cities in the world. Lagos and Abuja in Nigeria at 7 a.m. Please come out. In Lagos, we're on the Leki Koi Link Bridge, which I know Adesa will be with me <laughs> at 7 in the morning. And in Abuja is the old parade ground. But we're also in London, and we're in New York, we're in Frankfurt, we're in Dallas. And we, I believe and that- And you can do um, yours wherever it is you Cape are, Town. just like a walk, a so kilometer please, is good exactly, enough. Exactly, just come out, stand with Warif, support the cause. Mm -hmm. And I think next year, we'll be back here to share more stories yes. of the progress that we've made. Yes, it's been a good here. one. And again, like we say, take the message, imbibe it, and live it. You know, self-appreciate, Dr. Awashika said. Mm -hmm. Women need to self-appreciate more. We need to be careful how we raise our girls and our yes. boys and deal with the structural issues. And let's not judge those who've experienced some level of violence. Let's see them as survivors and help them, believe them, yes. and justice. Last but not the least, involve boys and men Absolutely. in the conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. This yes, afternoon. it's been great. See you next year when the 15 days of activism, the 16 days of activism, will be here again. Bye. Thank you again. Goodbye.